So we've been interested for a long time in the cardiology community to understand better why it is that women tend to have at least as many ischemic heart disease events as men, if not more. And yet, any time you take a woman versus a man to the coronary angiography suite, more often than not, the woman will have what's called non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And so it seems like there is this paradox that people have termed the CAD paradox, where women uh, tend to have just as much ischemic heart disease and are dying from ischemic heart disease, but without being diagnosed with coronary artery disease in the obstructive levels that we see in the angiogram. So we were interested in exploring why this may be the case using a different diagnostic tool than the classic traditional coronary angiogram, which really only focuses on the ob obstructive um, plaques of the proximal epicardial arteries. And so if you actually take a look at a, um, a coronary cast of the whole circulation, there are the, the large epicardial coronaries branch into many, many, many different arterioles and microvascular structures that aren't really captured by this luminal x-ray, which is really what an angiogram is. And so is it possible that we're missing diffuse atherosclerosis and missing a way to uh, quantify microvascular disease that may be more prevalent in women than men, but which may still be contributing to adverse cardiovascular events? So that's why we uh, thought to use this tool, which we actually already integrate into clinical care uh, using stress testing that we do at our institution at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, to also quantify the amount of myocardial blood flow in the whole coronary circulation. We take the ratio of that myocardial blood flow quantified at peak stress or hyperemia over that at rest, and that is what the coronary flow reserve is. And so most patients should be able to at least double their myocardial blood flow from rest to stress. And our data and that of other groups have shown that if that's the case, they tend to have better outcomes. But in patients who have an impaired CFR, um, who can't augment um, their blood flow as much um, in response to a vasodilator stress, they tend to have worse outcomes. So we were very interested in understanding why is that the case, and how is it related to the coronary angiogram? So for this particular study, we took patients who had both had a PET stress test and quantified CFR, and then followed with a coronary angiogram. So we could correlate abnormalities in CFR with abnormalities on the cath results. And what we found, interestingly, is that even though the women in the cohort, which were about, the cohort was about 40% women out of about 330 patients who met these criteria, even though the women seemed like they would have less risk factors at baseline, and they had um, less history of prior myocardial infarction or stenting, they had less obstructive plaque on the coronary angiogram, yet their outcomes, when you looked at cardiovascular death, um, and admission for heart failure and myocardial infarction were just as bad, if not worse, than the men's, even when you adjusted for any differences in the baseline factors. And so when you look at the flow reserve, what's interesting is that their flow reserve was not better than the men's. In fact, they were similarly impaired. And so when you then took that into account and you look at the survival curves of women versus men um, who in this cohort and followed them out for events, as I mentioned, the women did just as poorly as the men, if not worse. But if you then stratified by not just sex, but sex and CFR, it was not all women that did poorly. It was only the women with the low flow reserve that did poorly. And so when you then take the whole group of patients in this cohort who had a low flow reserve, and then you, you stratify by sex and by their angiographic disease severity, of the patients with low flow reserve, the men tended to have predominantly obstructive coronary artery disease, whereas the women predominantly had non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So if you were only looking at the cath results, you would miss that there was anything abnormal about this cohort of women, but in fact, their CFR was just as impaired. What's interesting, and I think what we take away from this, is that um, you know, there's a lot of uh, data uh, out there, including there was a Blue Cross Blue Shield report that was recently published um, looking at claims data over 2014 for over 40 million members. And they reported that 
women, there are disparities in post-MI care for women versus men because even though women and men tend to have similar rates of angiography after MI, women are getting 27% less uh, angioplasty and something like 38% less bypass surgery. And so they concluded that there are disparities in treatment. But if you know that for the most part, women have less obstructive coronary artery disease, even when they present for events, they may not be eligible for the kinds of interventions like angioplasty and bypass surgery because you know, it's not indicated for their kind of coronary artery disease, which may be predominantly non-obstructive. So I think what we take away from this is that you know, we need to start thinking about non-obstructive disease, diffuse atherosclerosis, microvascular dysfunction as real entities that are associated with poor outcomes. And even though revascularization focally or with bypass may not be the answer for that subset of patients, we should be thinking more broadly about systemic therapies to um, treat these patients, maybe through anti-inflammatory therapies, maybe through extreme lipid lowering therapies like the new PCSK9 inhibitors that we're hearing about now. Um, so that we treat this phenotype of coronary artery disease, which is, you know, is present in both men and women, but happens to be more prevalent in women. I think that it's probably multifactorial, and certainly, you know, the, through the life cycle, um, hormones play an important part in the differences between women and men. We don't know exactly how they interact with the vasculature to um, contribute to these phenotypes of coronary artery disease. We can't necessarily assess that from our study. We can hypothesize about it. Um, but in fact, what we know is that this group of patients, they weren't young necessarily. The average age was in the mid-60s. So these were older patients who had significant comorbidities. Many of them, over 80% had hypertension, um, over you know, 60 plus percent were dyslipidemic. There were about 30% diabetics. What we did see is that the women tended to be more diabetic than the men, even though all of the other risk factors, like the prior um, myocardial infarction history and angioplasty histories, were, um, uh, you know, were more prevalent in the men. And so this happened to be um, a cohort of women who were more diabetic, maybe slightly more hypertensive, and their outcomes tended to, um, in, to have a signal towards increased heart failure outcomes as well, which is not something that we've traditionally included in the composite endpoints for patients, but something that we recognize now, now that is an, an increasingly important burden in our society. And what we do know is that even um, certain types of heart failure, like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, are by far and away more prevalent in women as well. And we don't have great explanations for why that is. And it probably is, you know, um, a composite of many different comorbidities that associate to lead to this phenotype. So I think what we're left with is that there may be something about um, this cohort of women who are older and have a lot of comorbidities, including diabetes, um, that may predispose them to more heart failure outcomes. So it's not necessarily that they have so much obstructive plaque that's going to rupture and lead to an acute coronary syndrome, but perhaps there's something about their vasomotor function, you know, endothelial dysfunction, um, which leads to impaired diastology and impaired structural um, uh, heart disease, essentially, um, and heart failure outcomes. I take from the rheumatology literature that you know women with rheumatoid arthritis also tend to be predominantly older patients who may not necessarily manifest with obstructive coronary artery disease plaques on angiogram but are also at increased risk for cardiovascular disease events and so the common pathway there is increased inflammation and so perhaps there is something about increased levels of um, certain inflammatory cytokines that impair vascular function in ways that interact to lead to these kinds of outcomes, you know, heart failure outcomes, cardiovascular death outcomes, without necessarily leading to the big STEMIs that we're used to thinking about and that we've made great strides in treating by focusing on the angiogram and the stenting and the bypass surgery over the last, you know, 50 plus years. So I think it, what CFR allows us to do is it's a tool that allows us to quantify coronary artery disease and vascular dysfunction in, in a different way that kind of opens our eyes to what we don't see with the angiogram so that we can start to better understand the entire spectrum of coronary artery disease anatomically um, in men and women and diabetics and patients with heart failure with preserved EF.